running guns or shooting games too, right? And who doesn't love the Contra or Metal Slug series? But there's so many more obscure running guns out there, often just as good, that fell through the cracks, never saw ports outside of arcades, or were limited release for a specific console. So just like my last video for best action games you never played, we're digging deep and helping you discover some of the most kick-ass running guns. You've likely seen or played some of my picks, but I'll bet there's at least one or two here that'll blow your mind, wondering how you could have missed the game so good. So strap in for another avalanche, this time the baddest running guns that you absolutely need to play. Mystic Warriors is Sunset Riders with Ninjas, and it's by Konami. What? How was this game not way more popular? It has graphics and set pieces that rival and exceed Sunset Riders, and the music is freaking sweet. How did this not get a console port? Or any port, ever. It wasn't even that common in arcades, and it remains obscure. Now choose from four or five characters, as one of them is randomly picked as the hostage at the start, and you set out on a rescue mission that'll have you on skis, rafting, minecarts, planes, and a drive-in theater playing Sunset Riders on the big screen, until a flammable truck comes crashing through to ruin the party. The story and scenarios are cheesy as hell, and feel right out of a bad 80s flick, or a good 80s flick depending on your taste, with great music and terrible dialogue. Where is our friend? <laughs> Poor guy, your comrade is now... You've got a rapid shot, melee attack, can slide and use Nimpo, and can now hop up and down between platforms. But all the characters vary enough in shot speed, type, and movement to where you want to try out different characters. Like Sunset Riders, it's not overly deep gameplay-wise, but still takes plenty of skill to run through on a credit. It's more about playing with friends, the spectacle, set pieces, humor, and just cool factor that Konami games had during those years. It's oozing all the charm, tiny details, easter eggs, and those great one-liners. My rocket is the best! No! It's all here in vintage Konami fashion, not to mention a surprise and kind of messed up finale that I won't ruin here. Oh, and did I mention the music is super good? Damn, that's some enigma shit right there. So if you are a fan of riders, definitely give Mystic Warriors some time. It's not only fun to play, but it has a ton of memorable moments and really deserves a modern port, a prime example of how good Konami was during that era. Dino Gear is like the frantic parts of Strider in a cartoon dino world, and it never lets up, only it's much more run and gun than it is platformer. Stages scream by in minutes as you run, roll, vault, and blast your way across at a breakneck pace, but it's a lot deeper and more nuanced than the mindless quarter munching speed fest it first appears to be, with plenty of hidden areas and secrets galore. You'd think that with your massive size it's impossible to avoid damage, but your double jump and your roll both let you bounce off and hit enemies with the right timing, making Dynagear very much about keep away, using jump and roll for frames of invincibility, getting in your hits, then evading again. You can also grapple and climb walls, flip onto platforms, and generally anything to make traversing levels fast. There's not much awkward platforming here, as even the maze-like temple stage with traps and obstacles can be traversed quickly once you know the routes. A set of hearts and plenty of refills along the way make Dynagear easy to get into and play without frustration, but a gem to master and play expertly. Dynagear is every bit as creative as some of the best action games, with levels full of verticality, branching paths, and constant changes of scenery and enemies. It's Strider meets Flintstones in a prehistoric cartoon battle. You're aided by a beefy werewolf, who also doubles as player two for co-op, with a slightly slower speed but higher jump, and 
every one of the four weapons is really fun to use. Though the crazy ball and chain is definitely the standout, just not viable in every situation. The hidden secrets aren't limited to extra coins and score, as there's entire stage sections that you can find and explore once you know how to find them. That includes a freaking shooting stage, which I didn't even know existed until I saw some gameplay by O5 Pro. If you play Dynagear like a quarter muncher, that's what you'll get out of it. But dig a bit deeper, learn the evasion and invincibility frames, the boss patterns and all the routes, not to mention all the hidden areas, and you've got a really fun yet not overly difficult game to explore and eventually clear on a credit. Dynagear never saw a home release of any kind, but not due to lack of quality. It plays just as good as it looks and is one of those games that once you have memorized and can run through, is really fun to come back to for a quick challenge and run through again. you love the OG Contra games, but now find them way too easy after playing them to death? Do you laugh in the face of hardcores and demand a real challenge? Then the awesome but brutally tough Super Cyborg is for you. It kicks all sorts of ass, but mainly it'll kick yours on easy mode, which isn't an easy mode. It's just the easiest mode you'll get. So make sure you've got a sturdy controller and prepare to die a lot, just like the old days. But what makes Super Cyborg awesome, besides the obvious killer graphics, art design, and music, is that it's just as tight to control and addicting to play, keeping you going just to see a bit farther. Just like the hardest NES games, it'll frustrate the heck out of you with some cheap deaths and feel unfair, but it's equally exhilarating when you finally figure out a level and can run through it without death, mowing down everything with your spread gun to some great music. It also helps that the game saves your progress per level and gives you unlimited continues, as you'll definitely need it. The controls are simple, with a main shot, a charge shot, and jump, along with the very important hold mechanic straight out of hardcores that lets you stand in place while firing instead of running forward. Absolutely key to getting anywhere past stage four. Super Cyborg captures that all important rhythm of a good Contra game, always keeping you moving forward with a constant flow of incoming runners from either direction. Nearly every weapon is useful and having the more powerful laser or energy blast for bosses versus the spread gun takes them out a lot quicker. And these bosses are fantastic, not only for creature design, but the variety of attacks and phases to master. Even this walking hemorrhoid of a mini boss and its bouncing blue turds requires some trickery. Now, not all is perfect, as the one overhead level that it throws in is slow and lackluster, kind of a buzzkill compared to the other stages. You move way too slow, and the enemies are few and far between, and it's a bit janky by comparison. The homage was a cool idea, but it could be removed from the game, and it'd be the better for it. But those criticisms aside, it's certainly far more accessible than the 8-bit games that we had to painfully learn. Super Cyborg captures those Contra feels, and I love it. Music by Darkman07 is kick ass. The graphics are insanely creative, and it's exhilarating as hell to play when you're on a roll. And if you have a friend to play co op, so much the better. I realize it's not that obscure, and many of you may have played it, but it's so cool and under the radar that I wanted to highlight it for Contra fans that may have missed it. This is the kind of game I'm going to come back to and replay just for fun. So if you think you're hot shit and up for an old school 8 bit challenge, Super Cyborg is here to show you a good time. Just be ready to pop some hemorrhoids along the way, cause it's gonna be a bumpy ride. If you're looking for another metal slug that isn't a metal slug, then Demon Front is for you. Possibly the best metal slug clone ever. Not as good as the best in the slug series, but in my opinion, better than anything that came after the third game. Yes, it's that good. And if you haven't, you need to play it because it doesn't just boringly copy the slug games, but takes their style and mechanics and expands upon them in really fun ways. Whereas the slug series kind of got stale after such an over the top third entry, Demon Front is an inspired breath of fresh 
fresh air with its whimsical anything goes design. But it's not just the creativity and art style that's expanded, but also the gameplay. The biggest new addition is your pet, with each character having their own. Instead of throwing grenades, you press and hold fire to unleash its powerful attack. Even cooler, it levels up the more you use it, getting more powerful and gaining hit points, becoming a serious asset later in the game. You can even turn it into a temporary shield to absorb some hits before turning it back into pet form, up until it runs out of energy. It's such an important part of the game that you won't last long without it, so keeping your pet alive is vital. Rounding things out is an added float mechanic, where holding jump lets you glide float for larger distances. In general, you're fast and maneuverable, with the game throwing a ton of enemies your way, making for a super hectic and strategy-filled game of using your pet effectively, at least if you ever hope to clear it on a credit. Never being a fan, personally, of overly realistic military themes, the slug games really did it for me once the aliens and various creatures came into play, expanding on the universe. Same goes for Demon Front, where the crazy bestiary of demons, creatures, tentacles, and biomechanical monstrosities are always exciting to fight, not to mention gorgeous to look at. The pixel art is top-notch, both cute in a chibi-type way, but also super detailed and beautifully designed. The final boss of the game actually takes different forms, depending on the pet of the character you chose, which is a great touch. So if you've seen other reviews calling it a slug ripoff, but not as good, and you kinda skipped over it, you missed out. It's better than the later slug games, in my opinion, and is extremely fun to play. I will say though, most of the stage music is pretty uninteresting, and does very little for the game. Now, it's not that obscure, and if you're a fan of the genre, you almost certainly already know it. But if you know it, yet haven't played it, I'd recommend you give it a go. Any game that's good enough to be mentioned in the same breath as the original slug games is worth a play. And Demon Front is that, and then some. Someone was rocking the good stuff when they came up with this one. When the first 30 seconds of a game has you shoot down a mouse suit wearing perv, violently humping the bark off a tree, you know you're in for a weird time. And JJ Squawkers is definitely weird and obscure, but it's also a really fast and fun, if not overly short game. Your treehouse gets firebombed by crazies, and you set out on a revenge mission, taking you through five levels, with all but the first not making any sense outside of being on a psychedelic trip. It's not quite Cuphead, but it does have that old cartoon feel, only on magic mushrooms. The second level is something out of a weird dolly painting, abstract and deranged, which pretty much sets the tone for the rest of the game. And it's not quite the platformer that it appears to be, as those segments are always easy enough to navigate without presenting much challenge. A lot less platforming than something like Contra anyway, with a heavy focus on tons of enemies filling the screen, and a fast-paced action with a forward momentum. You can tell that it wasn't designed to be a precise platformer, as the jump is fixed, meaning a long or a short button press won't change the height or the distance, and you can't just turn in midair either, as you'll end up falling downward instead of backward, not to mention you can't run and shoot at the same time, so is it a run and gun or a stop and gun? It's very well paced though, and doesn't try to stretch out its short runtime, meant for a quick 20 minute blast through its four wild stages, because the fifth isn't really a stage, but kind of a disappointing boss rush only, punctuated by a visually crazy finale. You can torment the defeated bosses at the end of each battle, as they squirm in agony, or just teabag them if you're into that sort of thing. And because it's so short, it's easy to indulge in the second loop a bit, though not for long, as it gets out of control. Definitely not an oh my god must play game, Good, but not great, but quite obscure and worth a play for the fast pace and trippiness alone. And speaking of trippy as hell, this one's a quick bonus. No, this is not a great game, nor does it belong in any best series. It's actually kind of janky, and the sound design is borderline atrocious. <laughs> Damn if it isn't cool to look at, with really trippy visuals that make JJ Squawkers seem bland by comparison. It has an interesting mechanic for aiming, where holding down fire stops your movement, letting you aim in different directions without running. The problem is you then can't run and shoot, making it more of a jumping gun than a run and gun, since it's kind of the best way to keep moving and firing. Oh, and you can bounce on enemies and heads, Mario style too. I can't say for sure, but I think the music and sound effects violates more copyrights than Revenge of Shinobi on the Mega Drive. 
but don't let that stop you from playing it at least once to see all the crazy levels and enemies. It does look great and is a trip to explore, but the janky control and annoying sound design make it much more of a curiosity than a must play. Combine Alicia Dragoon with the spirit of Mystic Defender, throw in some talent from Developer Treasure, and you've got Psychic Killer Tarumaru, one of the rarest Sega Saturn games in existence. With graphics, bosses, and set pieces designed by Hiroshi Uchi of Gunstar Heroes fame, before going on to design Radiant Silvergun and Ikaruga. And while clearly not a treasure title, as it's not executed smoothly enough to be one, the design pedigree and creativity is all over this game. The obvious are the visuals, which while not colorful, or impressive at first glance, are so technically unique and meticulously designed that you can't help but marvel at the work that went into them. Much like Contra Hardcores, every stage is flooded with bosses, and nearly all of them are memorable. The amount of moving parts and appendages is very Gunstar, and disabling them in sections is often part of the challenge and strategy, like this massive frog as the current slowly forces you inward, eventually ending up being swallowed inside its belly to destroy it from within. No exaggeration, the dozens of bosses encounters in Tarumaru are a serious highlight, but the creativity extends to the stage backgrounds and enemies as well. Whether disabling a giant Godzilla-like skeleton from your boat as it destroys villages in the distance, or diving from a minecart and off a cliff, battling a giant eye while falling that traps you in a barrier, then riding in that bubble downhill using it to kill enemies for the entire next stage. Tarumaru is always throwing something awesome for you to do and never gets repetitive. Another aspect I liked is the continuity. You simply simply progress through the game as one large mission, really adding to the immersion. So it's a very good game, but not until you get the hang of the controls, which is where Tarumaru slips up, clearly not handled by the same level of talent that provided the incredible level and boss design. Like Alicia Dragoon, you auto-target enemies, but it's based on the reticle and will need to learn to cycle through enemies using the shoulder buttons. It's not always fast enough and often cumbersome to get the right target in time. Most of the time it works, but when it doesn't, it can be cheap. You'll need strategy, targeting, and killing the right enemies in the most efficient ways possible to play it well. You also do that using your charge attack, which can also bounce off and kill multiple enemies at once, while sliding to dodge, and using your quick shield to nullify damage from projectiles. It's very deliberate, and a brainless side-scrolling button masher this is not. The other problem is the lack of auto-fire, as in playing without it is just a no-go, which I imagine was a problem on original hardware. Try it that way, and you won't last long with all the mashing required, but grab a turbo controller, map one button for auto fire and the other for a charge shot, and you'll make the game a hell of a lot more playable and fun. So it's not perfect. The designs and levels are awesome, the bosses even more so, but the actual implementation of the graphics are hit and miss. I would have loved to see what it could look like with more traditional 2D art. The music is very cool, atmospheric, and creates a great mood, and the actual mechanics and strategy necessary to play the game well is fantastic, yet it's hampered by some middling control issues, not just getting used to, but sometimes fighting against. It speaks volumes that it overcomes its shortcomings to be a very good game. And just imagine how great it could have been if completely in the right hands of a developer like Treasure. But play it anyway, because what is great is really worth the playthrough. Hot Daddy. You can't have an awesome and obscure games video without them. And if you ever played Bloody Wolf on the TurboGrafx-16 and dug it, imagine that combined with Mercs, only way more crazy and hectic. And you've got Desert Assault, a balls out 90s style action hero run and gun, where Data East literally jumps the shark and cranks it to 11. So what else is new? Not only one of their best looking games, but equally killer in the music department, with over the top hard rock tracks that perfectly capture the machismo of an old action flick. Snake and Eagle from Bloody Wolf Return, along with two new members for some crazy four-player insanity. Despite still having an energy bar, Desert Assault was definitely built to eat quarters at a rapid pace. And if you play in a group, good luck staying alive or making much sense of it all. It's Data East, jank at its finest, but it's meant to be and it's fun as heck. 
going it alone is far more manageable if you're trying to get good. But don't expect a fair or technical one credit clear. You'll need lady luck on your side with how little space the game often gives you to dodge and stay alive. Your bombs are your friend and saving up enough for the later, harder bosses with some unavoidable damage is near essential to clearing it legit. This is all about spectacle, enjoying the ride, rocking to the tracks, and laying waste to everyone and everything. While the arcade operators get rich on your quarters, it's always throwing wrenches in the gameplay, in a good way, with gimmicks to keep you entertained. Whether riding a massive chopper, or avoiding searchlights as you infiltrate a base. But it never ceases to be straightforward and action focused. Now I'm not sure, but did some of the weapon voices here have an influence on the later Metal Slug games? <laughs> Heavy indeed. The US and world version of the arcade has a desert as the second stage, but the original in Japan, called Thunder Zone, was originally set in Antarctica. It's also less brutal than the souped up world version. So if you want to see penguins, and only penguins, go with the original. It even throws in some mini games in between stages, which I imagine are much more fun with friends to compete against. So Desert Assault is a Data East game in every sense of the word, right down to the Shark Week finale. A healthy combo of weird and awesome Awesome. And any fan of Data East wouldn't have it any other way. If you love the sexy toothpaste laser from Raiden, you can wreck house with one again in Gundara, a kick-ass running gun by Banpresto. It may look like a twin stick from this gameplay, but it isn't. Holding down the fire button is what locks your direction, so it's not as intuitive, but it works. Much cooler is your melee attack that doesn't just do damage, but can even kick bullets out of the air, making for a perfect iframes dodging strategy and integral to the gameplay. Gundara is far more nuanced and technical than the previous Desert Assault, with your biggest challenge being bullet visibility, as there's a lot of shrapnel and little explosions, often making it tough to know what to dodge and what's for show. Actually, make that the second second biggest challenge, as the first is making any sense of that mangled English opening, where supposedly children were uh, brainwashing in preparation for World War III. So the government chose two soldiers, who immediately started fighting. What? Each other? Or those nefarious children brainwashing? Don't try to understand, it'll just make your brain hurt. But Gandara makes up for it with really detailed graphics, and some absolutely ridiculous ridiculous moments, like blowing up a pig truck on this vehicle stage, for no other reason than to use these rolling hogs to rack up your score. No animals were harmed in the making of this game, but that's still messed up. Oh, and if I ever finally earn that corner office, this is the desk I want to have. Get out of my office, chump. It's Dumas, bitch. Oh, you were saving the children all this time. I guess that makes more sense. All jokes aside, Gandara is quite good. While the backgrounds are somewhat generic and the set pieces aren't on the level of Desert Assault, the visuals are extremely polished and the gameplay isn't nearly as janky. It's not overly difficult either by comparison and more fun to replay for skill. And of course, any game with a toothpaste laser this sexy is worth a playthrough. And those poor brainwashed children are counting on you. The most awesome thing about Gun Force 2 is seeing all the early inspiration by Nazca Corp that would eventually become the Metal Slug games. So don't call Gun Force 2 a Metal Slug ripoff, as it's actually Metal Slug Zero. Developed by Nazca and released by Iron, it also plays quite differently with a lot more mechanics that were later removed and streamlined for the Slug series. Even if the signature art style is there, you'll even hear a lot of the same sound effects that were reused later. <laughs> Probably the least obscure game in this list, yet surprisingly unported and unknown by many, given its roots. It's up there within the hunt, as one of the best Nazca developed games not called Metal Slug. Vehicular combat takes a more prominent role, with you pretty much riding everything from walkers, turrets, 
jeeps, tanks, a motorcycle, and even a flying mech suit shamelessly modeled from Gundam. You can also climb and hang, rope walk, and much more, similar to Contra games. Not to mention dual-wield weapons, letting you fire in complementary angles. I can see why they removed all these mechanics in the later Slug games, streamlining them for mass appeal. But it's cool having all these extra abilities and add strategy to the gameplay. Despite the Slug series taking it to the next level, by adding lots of humor and enemy variety, Gun Force 2 is definitely in the same league as the early Slug games, being just as visually insane with explosions, fire and brimstone filling the screen, and often causing quite a bit of slowdown on the hardware. It also has the crazy and memorable set pieces, like pulling off probably the longest wheelie of all time, while gunning down an alien centipede in hot pursuit. The flamethrower in this game is simply awesome, with massive reach and big damage, causing some serious havoc across the screen. And if you dig xenomorphs, you'll get plenty to torch straight out of aliens farther into the game. You'll also be rescuing scantily clad waifu, instead of old men flashing their underwear. That's a plus. If you still somehow missed Gun Force 2, it is a must play. Not as creative as the earlier Slug games, and it's much more serious without any story or ending to speak of, but it plays phenomenal, looks and sounds amazing, and is a great early entry into the Slug style of run and gun that would eventually become infamous. Of course, these are just a handful of amazing, obscure run and guns and other action games out there that I'd love to highlight. So look for more discovery videos just like this one coming soon. In the meantime, if you haven't already seen my best action games video, it was one of the all time most popular with some incredible can't miss platformers, shooters, beat em ups and more. And you can check that one out right here.